Hi folks, um, today I am going to be talking about a brief history of psychology and the science of psychology, part one. There's a part two we'll talk about in person next class. So the, the brief history of the psychology is something that MCPHS University wants me to inform you about, and I think it would be helpful overall for you to understand. And that part is not in your book. So the information that you need is in this presentation. And the science of psychology, we'll learn about two parts, and those are, in, those are chapter one of your book. Okay, let me um, play this slideshow. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I'm sorry I can't be with you to teach this in person, um, but thanks to the wonderful world of technology, we have this opportunity. So we'll go along and I'll try to be as interactive as possible. Okay. What you will need before you start um, are a printout of the slides so you can take notes on them and you'll need to work through a few problems. And you'll also need a degree handout that is in the module on Blackboard under Profession of Psychology. Um, you'll need to take notes on the degree handout as we go. So if you don't have those, pause this, go print them, or pull them up on your computer. Okay, so by this time, I will assume that you have read the Careers in Psychology reading article on Blackboard and the psychologist and primary care article on Blackboard. So something that's important to ask yourself that I'm wondering about is when you were reading about the careers in psychology and learned about the subfields, what subfield did you find most interesting? It's important to ask yourself this because one of the objectives of the course, remember, is to apply psychology to your life. So knowing this information now will really help you in writing the application paper when it comes time. So think about, pick two subfields that you found most interesting, and then jot just a few notes down about why you found that interesting. I believe last semester, these are the ones that folks found most interesting. They really liked clinical psychology, counseling psychology, cognitive psychology, health psychology, and rehabilitation psychology. The first two, um, clinical and counseling, are where people are trained to work with people with mental health issues and, and various other things. Um, so people in clinical or counseling can deliver therapeutic interventions or can be clinicians. They can also do research and be professors. Um, folks in these last three categories, well, actually, I take that back. Folks in cognitive psychology is the only one here that does not deliver any interventions. Thus, these people aren't who work in cognitive psychology are not clinicians. They don't do therapy at all. They do all research and teaching. And cognition is just a fancy word for thoughts. So it's people who study thoughts and the way that the brain works and memory, um, sometimes sensation, and how people make decisions based on thoughts. Health psychology is a whole major here at MCPHS. In, in fact, you may be a health psychology major yourself. And health psychologists... Um, have this really increasingly fundamental role in society that we'll talk about a little bit more. They are, they study the psychology of health. So you can imagine that if someone is diagnosed with cancer or is living with HIV or even um, needs to lose weight for some surgery and they have to adhere to a certain diet plan or a medication regimen. That all of those three things I mentioned are physical health problems, but there are a lot of mental health and emotional health um, factors that go into play. So you can imagine that being diagnosed with cancer or with HIV would be a big life-changing transition. And people may need support around, um, around that diagnosis. In, people in any three of those categories I named may need help making behavior changes. So um, someone living with HIV would have to start adhering to taking a medication regimen, um, maybe changing some of their behavior some. You know, they're going to have to engage in different safe sex practices. And who is going to help them make the lifestyle changes required to stay healthy? Those are usually mental health professionals in psychology. So the people in the last 
subfield here, rehabilitation psychology, usually focus on all those aspects of people with, with physical health problems that require rehabilitation, like learning to walk again, um, recovering after like a lung transplant, for example, just some different subfields. So take a look, find which ones are most interesting, and note why. Okay, so this is the gist that I hope you got from reading the Careers in Psychology website. Psychology really asks, why do humans behave as they do? And it does this by doing a few sample questions. How is thinking involved in behavior? How is childhood development involved? How you grow up, your parents, your not parents being there? How does that impact you later in life? How is biology and physiology involved? How do our neural structures impact our development? And um, how do other people affect how a human behaves? So do we behave differently if we're by ourselves than with other people? Of course we do. And we're going to talk about all of these things and more in this course. So here's an agenda. You can see on the right, this is a Greek symbol known as psi, and it is the it represents many things, but it represents psychology as a field. So you may see that. So the agenda today is a very brief history, and we're going to talk about who, what, and how psychologists do and are involved in. And then we're going to do science of psychology, part one. Okay, so let's start with our brief history. We are going to go way back to the... Um, famous Greek Plato, 300 to 400 BC even. And even at that time, he was a philosopher. And he asked, how does the mind work? Even early, early on, people were wondering, how does the mind work? What drives who I am and why I do what I do? So philosophers really contributed to the field of psychology. You're, I'm going to teach you about two more people who contributed to the field of psychology. So we've got roots in philosophy with Plato. And then we've got roots in physiology. This is Wilhelm Wundt. He's a German physiologist. So he studied the human body and anatomy in the late 1800s in Germany. And he used what's called structuralism to study the mind in Germany. He saw that physiologists, he was trained as a physiologist. So he would use structuralism, which is understanding the structure of something to study the human body. So if you were to ask about the heart, he would say, we study the heart by breaking it down into its parts. What valves does it have? What arteries come in and out of it? And that is using structuralism, which we'll talk about a little bit more. So we have physiology, influence on psychology. Well, eventually, Wilhelm Wundt was visited by William James. So he was trained um, as a medical doctor in the late 1800s in Europe. He was actually born in America, I believe, and went to Europe. I think he, he like, after medical school, like, went backpacking across Europe or something and heard about Wundt and his work and went to work with him and said, Wilhelm Wundt, I love what you're doing. I love that you're asking questions, you know, what makes up the mind with structuralism. But I think what's more important is this thing that he eventually developed called functionalism. So functionalism is asking not just what makes up the mind, but what's the function of the mind? How does the mind work? So William James sort of started learning from Wundt, but developed it a in a different way to functionalism and spread that to America. So here we have the influence of philosophy from Plato, physiology from Wundt, and we have finally William James who um, called it psychology ultimately. But keep in mind, William James was not trained in psychology as it is today. He was trained as a medical doctor, so in medicine. So all these fields have, have contributed to what psychology is today. So what do you notice about these men? Just taking a minute and thinking, what do these three figures here have in common? I'm going to give you a little quiet time to think about it. <laughs> How are they the same? Well, we know none of them were traditionally trained in psychology because it didn't really exist yet. Uh, they're all men. You may have noticed that they're all white. Plato has a, a statue there. Um, he was a white person. Um, so think about how may 
you know, if these are the three sort of like big founding figures that are contributing to psychology, how do you think having all men who are white, who are really trained in, you know, physiology, philosophy, and medicine, how do you think that affected the early study of psychology? Think for just a second. Some ideas, and you know, there's there's truth to this in the historical records, are that by having all men, they weren't typically thinking about women's issues. Typically, when they were conducting research, it was usually on all men. So they would maybe be studying intelligence and intelligence tests. That's one example. Intelligence tests are administered by psychologists. And in the early testing in the 1900s in America, um, when they were developing them, they tested the intelligence tests on millions of men in the army. And, you know, who is that really leaving out? That's leaving people who aren't in the army. That's leaving out women. Um, you can imagine that also all of these men may not be thinking about the impact of discrimination on themselves. So people of color who are who are of a race that is not white have a different experience in the world. So you can imagine that the earlier days of psychology didn't pay attention to discrimination, oppression, racism, sexism against women. Um, so there's a lot of cultural aspects that were addressed much later on in psychology. So let's take a look at an example. Oh, forgot about this. First, let's do a quick review of what structuralism and functionalism is, okay? Just to make sure we're clear. So structuralism studies the structure of something. You know, the word structure is in there for a reason. It asks what, what's in there. It analyzes the basic elements of something. So an example in psychology. What are the basic elements of consciousness? Maybe some answers are breathing. You have to be breathing to be conscious. Brain waves are different when you're conscious. You have them when you're conscious. The subjective experience of being alert. Subjective just means it's your internal experience. It can't be measured very objectively. You report on it. So structuralism would ask what are the basic elements of something, consciousness, for example. Now functionalism is different. Remember, the word function is in there. It studies the function of something. It asks how does this work? What's the function of this thing? It analyzes the purpose that something serves. So an example in psychology is related to consciousness is what is the purpose of consciousness? An answer, you know, one possible answer is to be able to adapt to the world and survive in it. Consciousness allows humans to be able to survive in the world and pay attention and learn from trial and error and avoid dangerous situations. So you can see how structuralism and functionalism can study the same things, but they study it in different ways. So structuralism is what? The structure Functionalism asks how and asks about the function. It's important to understand how these two concepts really impacted the development of psychology. You have psychologists who honestly study both today. So here's an, here's an experience to test your knowledge. Experience the arm. This magnificent arm here. Random Google image I pulled up. Okay, what questions would a structuralist ask about studying that arm? What questions would a functionalist ask about studying that arm? So a structuralist studies the structure, studies what? What questions would they wonder about the arm? And I'll provide some pauses after questions like this to give you a chance to write down some notes, come up with an idea yourself. Okay, so what questions, think about this, write an, write an idea down. Would a functionalist ask about studying an arm? They're studying the function of something. Okay. Well, I hope you came up with some good ideas. There are answers to these questions at the end of this PowerPoint you can look at. Okay. So we sort of talked about this question already. How do you think these founders affected the development of psychology? You've got people from philosophy, physiology, and finally William James in psychology. And we already talked about that a little bit. And those are just my ideas about how that probably impacted. You may have come up with some on your own, and it doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means I didn't 